Welcome to Bespoken Bones with your host, Parvani Moray, connecting ancestors, sex, magic, and science. Parvani explores transpersonal tools for erotic wellness every new and full moon, engaging educators, healers, spiritual leaders, and scientists in revolutionary dialogue. Get ready to feel good and go deep. This is Bespoken Bones. Hi, and welcome to Bespoken Bones, ancestors at the crossroads of sex, magic, and science. We're in the business of healing trauma, connecting with our roots, and developing radiant erotic wellness in past, present, and future generations. And I am your host, Pavani Moray. And today it's a super big treat to introduce you to Lynn Breedlove, who is the author of the novel Godspeed. And you probably know them from the band Tribe 8, lead singer, also the writer and performer of Lenny Breedlove's One Freak Show, which was a comic solo show on gender and also uh, a book came out of that, which won a 2010 uh, Lambda Literary Award in the transgender category. So um, also, Lynn is the founder of Homobiles, which is an indie nonprofit startup that's a ride service for the queer community and allies, um, and which won him the 2012 Harvey Milk LGBT Club Award for Activism. And um, lots of ways to connect with Lynn, you can check out his website, which is lynnbreedlove.com, uh, and we'll be talking about some other ways later in the show that you can uh, plug into Lynn's work. So just such a, such a great thing to have you on the show, Lynn. Thank you for being here. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah. Um, so I want to dive in and talk about punk rock ancestors. And so when I say that, who comes to mind for you? Mm, Darby Crash. You mean dead people? <laughs> well, you know, I mean, it's, it's, there's that liberal space, right? When we're elders and, and we're crossing over, but like, like who are the, the folks who really, um, maybe who are dead, but who also have like really inspired you and, um, you know, kind of given you that, like instilled in you that lineage of, of queer punk rock. Well, Freddie Mercury for one, Yeah, uh, you know, like when I was first coming out and my best, one of my besties, there, there was, I had three gay male homosexual best friends in high school. And uh, one of them, Chester Lanes, he was like, oh, look, this guy's gay. L- listen to this record. Day at the Races, listen to this record. Night at the Opera. And I was like, he's gay? <gasps> how can he be gay? That re- mm. There are songs on the radio. So how can the singer be gay? Because they don't let gay people be on the radio. And then Sylvester was on the radio. And then, you know, we started to go, oh, shit. We are everywhere and we're on the radio right now our people have number one hits and we're dancing to their music right now so yeah sylvester and freddie mercury were really big when i first started listening to uh queer music and punk music i started listening this friend of mine played a couple records uh the tubes and they played white punks on dope. And I was like, oh my fucking God, this is hilarious. And they play Mondo Bondage and um, and also Bette Midler. And I was like, oh, well, she must be queer because she sings at the Baths in New York. And then um, I developed a crush on her. And then I was totally crestfallen when I found, oh, she was married. I did I get it. And I, you know, I was really in denial about the fact that <laughs> certain kind of women that like to hang out with gay guys, but they were not interested in me. And I was like, oh, this is so weird. Okay. Um, anyway, I had a lot of crushes on straight girls uh, most of my life until I discovered films. Um, but anyway, um, yeah, like that. And then as I got older, when I listened to, oh, well, Prince. Yeah, and, totally. You know, we all had ideas about he was pretty queer in the beginning and as he got older and he got more into the christianity thing 
I don't know, but the eighties, he was fucking queer and like Wendy and Lisa and like him saying, actually like basically saying like, we're all queer, calm down in his songs. Don't panic. It's all good. We're all queer. We're all queer. <laughs> and, and and then to have people like erase that later when he died um, was weird to me. Same with George Michael, you know, mm, it, mm-hmm. when, you know, they always come up with these weird reasons people die. And I'm always like, what was it HIV? Oh, you can't mention that because people are like, oh my God, no. Are you insinuating that he was gay and that he was, had a filthy disease like HIV? I'm like, whoa, what do you, don't be saying that about my friends now, you know? So there, there was quite, there were quite a few threads of, uh, people arguing about David Bowie's sexuality, um, gender, everybody's gender, everyone's sexuality, whether or not they did anything untoward when they were high on Coke, you know, all this stuff of like, Oh yeah. You know, these people were, the people that inspired me, including Patti Smith. She was also queer. She sang a lot of queer songs, songs to babes. So did Susie, Sue, the Banshees. And so I feel very protective of folks that were out on the edges and like fucking with that um, when I was young and coming out in the first decade or so. It was really important to me. Totally. Yeah. I, you know, it's interesting because I feel like um, I grew up in Cleveland's in the eighties and was definitely, you know, part of the hardcore scene there. And, you know, it totally, there was no space for folks like me, uh, trans folks, femme folks, queer folks, gender fuckery folks, but yet like that space of, of the punk scene, like totally saved my life. Right. And then there were like these other influences, things like, you know, John Waters and divine. And, um, I was reading all the Armstead Maupin books and, um, and so, like getting that sense of queerness alongside of of punk, and um, but those things not not quite fitting together, even though in in my body and in my heart and my, all of my friends' bodies and hearts, they did right. Like, like we were all queer, right? And so, but you did it. You really took all of that and you made a space for who you were when there wasn't a space, right? Like you were like, "Fuck you! I'm I'm going to make this space." for people like me in, in this kind of music. And I'm just curious if you have anything you want to say about that. As a kid, I, I didn't really, I was an only child. So I spent a lot of time by myself. I um, tried to like make friends with uh, the girls in the neighborhood. I was friends with a lot of boys, but as soon as they hit 12, we got in fights and they beat me up in front of everybody and was like, uh-uh, no girls. Mm. I was like, wait, what just happened? Um, so, you know, I was weird. You know, my mom took me to Europe a lot and I was like, I don't fit in. And she wouldn't let me have a TV. And I was like, I don't know what they're talking about. I feel really alienated. Use that word, of course. But I was like, I need friends. And she was like, no, you're special. You're a Lenny Breed love. Don't forget it. And all that. And uh, I don't fucking need to be special. I need to blend in here. You know, I need to be validated by someone besides my mom, who basically was just trying to really forced me into a girl box, you know? And I was like, I'm not a girl. Um, but anyway, uh, so it's important to me when it, it stood out to me when people were weird and different. So Bette Midler was weird and different. Jim Morrison was weird and different. He was with the leather pants and the lizard King and all that. He was really queer seeming to me. Um, anybody that was a writer, songwriter and like, did some totally off the wall weird shit that drew in people from all different kinds of across the spectrum of society. Like everybody liked them. Everybody wanted to be them, you know, boys, girls, everyone in between. We're like, Oh, that person's got a something thing. And you know that they didn't have any friends when they were kids either. Probably. Yeah. You know, (laughs) we're weird. And I'm like, Oh yeah, that's cool. So after, and oh, and, uh, Black Flag was a huge in- influence uh, in the 80s for me because they were funny. They were ironic and they were they made jokes about just being a drunk punk and superficial. <laughs> and I thought that was hilarious. That was a great way to approach it about how to bitch about stuff was to just joke about it. So by the time I got clean and slobber, as I like to say, uh, 
I felt like carving out a space for myself, they had already created all these inroads into being weird, being yourself, being an individual, and making it cool somehow. So, and also, I had just done a whole bunch of drugs for like 15 years. And boy, that really put me out on the edge of society. And I was ready to come in a little bit and find some community at that point. So what ended up the confluence of those two things of being weird and different and also needing community was like, who's the weird and different people that need community? Well, queers, dykes, you know, that's, I don't know, it just all kind of happened at the same time where dykes needed to jump around and yell. And we were like, we're just the people to help you. With that. <laughs> I mean, it sounds like a calling. It kind of was. It was like a, uh, what do you call it when it's a perfect yeah, storm. It was that moment. We had just been dealing with a lot of Reagan Bush bullshit for a decade, thinking we were going to blow up in a nuclear war yep. any second. And because of that, the the gratitude piece about that is you could, you really could just be like, okay, we'll just live for today. Could die tomorrow. It's all going to go up in flames. You might as well party now. You know what was weird about then is that like all those things were happening, like Prince and George Michael and Boy George and all that was happening, like even like Motley Crue. I don't remember like the the hair bands, right? Like all that was happening. Uh And like everyone was publicly fucking with gender, right? But it like nobody was talking about it. There wasn't any like critical analysis of it. And just because they did it didn't mean that I got to do it. Didn't mean that we got to do it. Right. It was like, it was something that um, you had to have a certain level of, you know, social capital to do. And then you could be safe. But if you were like transgressing, like, you know, just at the like regular human level, you were, yeah, you were just a weirdo. Right. Yeah. Yeah. New York dolls. Uh, Well, you know, I didn't even know about Jane County until the nineties. I met her and like, pulling all kinds of like crazy shit. And yeah, it was punk rock to fuck with gender. So you could just be like, I'm not really trans. I don't even have a name right. for this. I'm just like, don't put me in a fucking box. Exactly. Yeah. In any realm, including gender and sexuality. Yeah. You've talked about it um, in your writings about punk rock being queer by nature. Like that it's just, it is in its essence queer. And I hadn't ever really thought about it like that. Like I've thought about like queer core, queer punk rock, but I hadn't ever been like, oh yeah, right. That whole thing is queer, right? Yeah. Because the whole binary, and it's, it's oppressive, you know? It's just like all these rules and the establishment or whatever they're called in any given generation, the people that want to hand down the rules and parent you and tell you what to do, just fuck you. No. I'm not doing that. I'm not doing me. Who are your Who are your favorite <laughs> um, musicians right now? Just curious. Whoa, let's see. I really like Trap Girl, um, and I like Squid Ink. Trap Girls from L.A. And you know about them? Nope. Drew is the singer, and she's like, if anyone wants to know who the Queen of L.A. is, tell them she's. Trans, Latina, and fat. Oh, yeah. And she's really into uh, Seven Year Bitch and like 90s chick rock, and she's heavily influenced by Tribate. So, of course, no. <laughs> I'm not only really interested. No, but <laughs> she's just like really channels fucking 90s fucking rape revenge rock, chick rock. She's a badass. And anyway, Squid Ink. They are a cool band of women of color from Fresno that we just played with at Fabulosa and um, the Home Bills. And um, let's see, who else is a genius? Limp Rest, of course. And um, who would I play with if I could? I just love everything Kathleen Hanna does. And she's like, she's an honorary queer, but. She's always stood up for queers, and um, I'm always and her music's just fucking awesome. Her voice is awesome; it inspires me. So, yeah. she really like stuff that she does. She's doing the spam Julie Ruin right now, and Justin Vivian Bond, who does a lot of lounge stuff, but like whatever, just like mostly it's a comedy act sprinkled with songs. 
for a live act these days. So I fucking love them. They just changed their pronoun from mix to them, actually. Um, so yeah, like that. It's a mix. Yeah, cool. I always love hearing what other people are listening to. And um, you said inspires you, right? Like, and I just wonder about that because like, you're talking about other people's brilliance. And I mean, of course, you know, there's your own brilliance. And I just wonder if like, where, um, like, how do you find that that lives in your body? Like, how does it, how does it come to you? How do the, um, those flashes of insight or like, where you're like, yeah, I'm going to do this. Like, what do you notice about that? Or what do you know about that? Well, the thing is those insights can happen throughout the day. So you've either got to have a piece of, you know, you've got a pad and paper, a uh, pad of paper, like a little one in your pocket with a pen, or, which I used to have all the time, piece of paper, pen, and just stop on my bike and write. And then I would just practice that line over and over. And over. I wrote a lot of tribe eight songs uh, and, and Godspeed. Um, but also I'm riding my bike or driving. Sometimes I just put on voice memo on phone and blather into it. And then later I listen and see if it's something I could salvage or not. Um, but I also do a thing now, this isn't quite what you're asking, but I'm getting there, uh, which is I do morning pages. So when I wake up, I get my coffee, and then I write for three pages. It could be small pages. It could be big pages, but just write. You just pen moving across the page. You can write down your dreams, write down what's bugging you, write down what you love. Um, and then a lot of um, this upcoming book came out of those morning pages. You know, I would start just like venting and dumping whatever is in your mind and then you start to write and then you start to create so um i do that stuff and it's the actual act of writing weirdly that is where creativity comes from for me it's like the writers have always said is like you sit in front of the blank page until something comes out well i don't never have a blank page i just start writing i just start blathering i don't care if it's good or not It'll get good later once I get into the rhythm of it and the voice starts to come through. But if I'm just staring at a blank page trying to think of the perfect words, that's not how it comes. So it's just in the process of doing it that is where inspiration really hits. Yeah. I mean, or it can hit at any time of the day and you better be ready for it and grab it when it comes. Right. And just have like a fucking journal around all the time and writing or whatever your thing is, singing, you sing into the phone and record it, whatever have that be happening all the time. And yes, exactly. And then later you go through and you edit, you circle the things that were good. Oh, this paragraph. Whoa, we're going to start a whole <laughs> chapter based on this one. You know what I mean? Yeah. And then it's like maybe 20% of what you spew out is going to stick to the wall. Yeah. I mean, it just strikes me that it's like the process. It's like um, the process of being creative is what actually inspires creativity, right? And you're saying, oh, I have this practice that I do of the morning pages. And that that is like that the practice is how um, I hold a container for that or something, right? Right. Yeah. And I'm just curious about like, do you hold that as like a spiritual practice or any ways that um, that those things weave together for you? Oh, yeah. Morning pages is definitely, if I don't do my morning pages and uh, and I forget, or I'm in a hurry, or I just jump into my pants and out the door or something because I have to do other things, be a service, or help somebody, or just go to a court date, or whatever. Who fucking knows what? I didn't get up early enough. You know, I fucked it up. So then later, usually some stupid shit will happen where I was ungrounded, or I blurted out a thing, or I reacted, and I'm saying, I have to be like, oh, shit, I'm sorry, I was an asshole. You know what I mean? And I'm like, what happened? Oh, you didn't do your morning pages because, you know, I have to do a certain number of grounding rituals every day so that I can act like a human because my dad was just talking to me about, <laughs> I mean, you know what I mean? I'm like, you are nuts if you don't fucking. If you don't do your practices. Yeah. You got to have rituals. And my dad's like, why do performers and singers and writers and actors and shit, why are they always crazy? And I'm like, well, because you have to be a certain kind of like, hold my beer adrenaline junkie kind of person to jump on stage and fucking tell jokes because you're either going to kill or you're going to die. And that's what it takes to get your synapses firing as life or death situation, you know, about comedy. They call it killing or dying. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, if I killed means I told the jokes. Yeah, and you yeah, laughed. yeah, yeah. You killed it. You didn't laugh, or I died. So, yeah, yeah, I died. And so, uh, so the point being, like that person can't be revving at 100 RPM all day long like that. So they usually end up like trying to drink or smoke weed or take whatever kind of fucking downers to like tamp that shit down or Ritalin or whatever people do to try to like control that so that they can navigate the world the rest of the time when they're not in the spotlight. And that's where, when I had to take that part out because that shit was killing me. So I, but you can't take out a thing that you use to stay sane and not replace it with a thing. Uh huh. And so when I pulled out drugs and alcohol, I had to replace it with prayer, meditation, uh, movement, uh, creativity, and uh, and working with others, you know, basically having people who have more experience in this, you know, spiritual fitness realm, helping me figure out what my practice was going to be every day. Oh, that's super interesting. So when you're saying spiritual fitness, it's like you're getting it's that that force that comes through, that inspiration, that creativity, is um, it's a fire. It's it can burn you. It right. It it takes a container that can hold it without. Um, self-destructing. And right, we're talking about all these folks who actually like have gotten like Jim Morrison, right? Like folks who have gone through that process of self-destruct, right? You can't hold it. And so like, how do you let it move through you and how do you be with it and be grounded and still be committed to letting it, letting it come through you? Yeah. Right. Exactly. Yeah. That's cool. Was there, was there a choice point for you? Was there a moment where you were like, oh, like, okay, I, I either have to change the the way I'm holding this brilliance or it's going to destroy me? Well, crazily, I, the whole time I was doing drugs and alcohol in my, in the eighties, uh, I tamped it down so much that I was afraid to do anything like grab a mic. I was just like, Oh hell no. You know, I just like to be by myself in my room and write reams and reams and reams of bullshit, utter bullshit. I found some later in, in sobriety, 10 years later in my garage. And I was like, oh shit, I better burn this. Then he finds out what a fucking <laughs> terrible writer I was. But um, didn't matter. I needed to get whatever those demons were out. And it was cheesy and was stupid, but whatever. It helped. It probably kept me alive at the time. But it was when I did a fish dance, I shot up a bunch of coke and, and did what we call a fish dance, flopping around on the ground. And I was like, uh-oh. You could die. Oh, shit. I don't want to die. Oh, I didn't know you could die from Coke. Or, you know, or worse, you're walking around like with the face all froze sideways. You know, geez, this is a bad problem. Okay. So then I started to chill. And it was after I got sober that I really delved into creative work because I had to replace drugs and alcohol with real creative work. Not just work where I sit at home alone in my room. But the part where you go out and share it with the world, produce a piece, whether it's a record, a song, uh, a book, uh, a spoken word piece, go on tour with Sister Spit, go on tour with your band and share that with community. That was a whole nother level. And that was amazing. I was like, oh, who knew? This feeds the fucking soul. And have people come up to you afterwards and be like, thank you. Oh, my God. You saved my life. Mm, mm-hmm. You know, I'm like, I did what I do. Mm, well, mm. because you sang a song about being queer and I thought I was the only queer in bumfuck Idaho, but I, then I knew it wasn't. I was like, oh, shit, this is important. We all have to do it. And so then those people would come up to me and go, when are you coming back to my town? And I'm like, no, we're n- you can't wait 364 days for us to come back to your town. You got to start your own band and like bring that in your region all the time. So it was like starting a fire of creativity wherever we went. So like in your perfect world, there would be just a legion of queer bands everywhere, just really 
channeling that life force and and killing it? Well, I for me when I first started out, like yeah, a band was what I needed because and it still is because I might sit here in my room going like, gee, I really ought to write a book. Oh, gee, I really ought to sing a song or, you know, but when I have five other people waiting for me at band practice, looking at their watch, I'm fucking, I have to go. And it really helps me because I, I do it for other people. Mm-hmm. And then when they're like, we have a show and you have to be there at six o'clock on Saturday night, do you load in? I'm like, okay. So it forces me to go. When people are waiting and I'm on the flyer, I go. Mm-hmm. If I wasn't on a flyer, eh. That's so interesting. So it's like community is the thing that helps you hold it. Right. And collaboration, like yeah. a collaborative yeah. project. I l- also love as the solitude of writing. That's great. But then there's the editing part and the publishing part and the fucking all this other part where you have to talk about yourself and write a bio. And that's weird. You saw how hard it was for me to get you a picture and a bio and a URL. I'm like, "Eh, that's hard. But it's all part of being a successful artist. And if you're collaborating with other people who maybe they have talents in those areas, you're more likely to do the service that I think really art is for art is service you are serving your community you are helping others live and thrive by producing stuff that other people can access you just sit in a room writing poetry all day nobody's affected by that i yeah so art is service i mean i get it in in the bigger scope it's like what happens when we don't have our artists it's like what happens when we don't have our queers what happens when we don't have our trans folks what happens when we don't have our weirdos right it's like there's that um the me- the making of meaning, the ones who are saying, hey, there's something really beautiful and important and or terrible and horrible, right? That it's like the um the collective attention. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and there are a lot of people out there that they don't have a, a spiritual practice or they don't have an art a creative a creative practice. And they are out there waving signs and fucking campaigning and, you know, trying to help the homeless or whatever. And those folks may or may not be inspired by you to also make art at some point in their lives, but they are really reliant on you to bring a show to them where they can dance in the mosh pit and fuck shit up and yell and sing along. And that is cleansing to them. So, you know, Not every single person is like fed by art. I do believe everybody should do some kind of art because I feel like if you did, you'd be happier because that's the godhood flowing through you. Godhood is creation. You know, you are being a god. You are doing god work when you make a thing, you know? And so that is helpful. It gives you your life purpose and meaning and gives you joy be enthusiastic about life and then that inspires other people to also be happy otherwise you're just like oh shit we got an asshole in charge (laughs) you know that's not fun who wants that totally lynn talk to me about um like what you see as the sacred role of being gender liminal Hmm. well how i see it for me yeah or in general both well I'm really interested in how, like, there's trans ladies in India who have for millennia been designated as the people that go around and bless the newborns. And they bring a bowl and people put rice in the bowl and it's cool, you know? It's like everybody has a job. And so, you know, there's a lot of transphobia there as well now, but, and also, they have a sacred job. You know, that is a sacred job that you could do if you're a trans woman in certain parts of India. Um, There's, of course, two spirit stuff. And, um, you know, if you're not Native American, then, you know, you're probably not going to want to access that. Uh, But it's helpful to hang out with other people that, you know, have your Native background. If, If you're Native American and you have other friends that do that, there's like stuff, powwows. Two spirit mm, powwow, mm-hmm. like the Bates thing that happens yeah, in Bates, the, Bates, yeah. the area, American Indian two spirits, and there's one in Montana that's really cool that I want to go to. That's like 
by uh, right by where my my grandfather was born in that reservation. Uh, so I really like throughout history. It's validating to me to know that throughout history in all kinds of different cultures, uh, queers have been like, oh, well, you're cool and weird and have both things going on and all the things. Mm-hmm. You must have one foot in the other realm. Okay, well, why don't you help us with this spiritual practice? Um, for me, well, I think that when you get um, edged out of society for whatever reason, you know, it's class, race, gender, sexuality, whatever the thing is, uh, ability, body stuff, um, or if you're hurt, you know, if like something, you know, you have some kind of trauma happen to you. Uh, but also just being banished from society is like not fitting in is a kind of trauma. Um, that can, for me anyway, I feel like it opened me up to the infinite possibilities of all that is. You know, I was like, huh, well, I don't fit in here and yet I'm still here. So I guess I don't have a bunch of constrictions on me. So why not believe in everything? Cool stuff that I can't see. You know, it just it, it opened up my imagination and it opened up the realm of possibilities for me. And so it's much easier for me to have a spiritual life, I feel like, than some people who've been raised to just like, well, you're going to grow up and you're going to have 2.3 kids and a dog and a white picket fence and you're going to be heterosexual and you're going to do the missionary position and you're just going to have that one person that you met in high school your whole life and they're going to die and then you're going to die and, and then you're going to leave your house to the kids and that's that. And I guess for those folks, it's like they also get possibly spoon fed some kind of organized religion. And that never moved me. I was like, God, you guys have to sit here and not move and listen to this guy yammer on for an hour. Jesus Christ. You know, my cousins, my aunt and my cousins used to drag me to church every now and then. I'm like, this is terrible. Yeah, it's so cool because it's like what seems like a burden, right? Of, you know, culturally, you're not getting all of the, the capital, you're not getting all the cred of, of, you know, having, following those societal norms. What you're saying is like, and I, I totally believe this as well, that like the, the trauma of that, that it's actually a gateway into a deeper experience of, um, being human and being in contact with spirit and, and the unseen world, right. Of like trauma being um, a threshold almost. And like, I think about it, like all the coolest folks that I know have serious, you know, are, are queers with trauma, right. Or like that state of it, it changes something and it gives you access to things, even though like there's lots of suckiness about it. It also, um, it comes with a lot of hidden gifts. Yeah. 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 Well, yeah, I know people that had serious childhood trauma where they had to leave their bodies regularly. You know, they just had to to function, you know. And so now they know how to leave their bodies and on command. Like they can meditate and transcend. They can like you know, see and hear stuff that and understand stuff that other people can't see because like they only believe in the material world, you know. So I did not have that level of trauma, but I definitely had a dysfunctional enough family where I, I had to look at life differently. I had to grow up before, you know, I had to take care of my mom. And, uh, when I was a little kid and, uh, also the queerness part of spirituality is, um, when I first got sober, we had all these books that had God, the word God in it. And we were a bunch of little punk rock feminist dykes that were like sex workers and bike messengers. And we were just like, ah, punk rock, mohawks, and a bunch of facial piercings. And we were just like, this archaic language is not going to work for us. So we just went through and changed every word God to, we added D-E-S-S. We just changed it all to goddess. And, uh, and now I'm like, what well, could be God? It could be goddess. It could be gods. It could be any number of things, but really to me, that, you know, concept is genderless. And I kind of feel like I am too. So I feel like now, instead of changing all the pronouns for God from he to she, I would just change them to them. (laughs) One of my, on your website, one of my favorite things is it says, 
you said people always ask me if I'm a man or a woman, and I'm always like, do I look like I know? <laughs> <laughs> what are you asking me for? Do I look like I know? Uh, <laughs> yeah. But yeah, God is genderless. Is totally. where, where I am today. But also that whatever that concept is, gratitude over despair or whatever, is a reflection of where I'm at at any given moment. Whatever that is has to be something I can relate to. So it tends to have whatever gender I have Mm -hmm. at any given point. I mean, I kind of think about, like, I think of it as genderqueer privilege of like, all right, which bathroom line is shorter? Which bathroom is cleaner? Yeah. Which is which is going to get me access to the thing that I want right now? If I have to pick a box, all right, cool. Like, well, I want, you know, that there's a, um, yeah. All the things. Yeah. <laughs> I get in everywhere. What? <laughs> <laughs> just let me in. Just let me in. <laughs> oh, I just, I wanted to um, talk about, you had mentioned uh, poetry and writing. Mm-hmm. And I just wanted to... Um, see in light of our conversation, it would be, you know, really welcome if you wanted to read something. I know you have a new book coming out. Okay. I could read like the opening uh, poem, which I mean, I was just writing these poems every day to my girl trying to impress her with what a genius I was. Not really, but (laughs) I was writing to her every day because she inspired me because she's amazing and I was in love. And all of a sudden she was like, these are a book here, they need to be arranged like this. And I was like, uh, okay. I never really wanted anyone to read these poems, but anyway, here they are. And she thinks this poem should be first. It's called In Camps Even Atheists Pray. All it is, please guide us out of this darkness. In this moment, crying. In this moment, sure. Laughing, fucking, eating, replicating plates served by mothers. Channeling Taurus full moon and dead moms and live dads, grounded, forward going, get out of jail free, avoid jail entirely, make it happen, magic and glamour, money, fashion, shine, charm, build it, action, true love always. Bring Mandelas, Mumias, Panthers and Kings, bring Peltiers and Black Elks and Lame Deers, bring Maya Angelou all aglow. And how she says, Bring your ancestors with the end of the room, and what will be read is power, charisma. All the angels, all stars, all the ghosts. Uh, Sophie Scholl, the White Rose, von Stauffenberg, Anne Frank, and Marlena. All the nameless who gave a crust of bread to someone who wasn't going to live anyway. All the retro planets saying, save your energy till late in the game and then slingshot it through the eye of despots. Blow everything sky high at once. Take out killers with our high-powered books and subcultural standards of beauty and good looks. And if you're lucky, just keep reloading, picking off evil. Keep them in your sights. Crosshairs, the only cross you pray to or bear. Leave behind you a trail of stars to X marks the spot, to treasure, to hearts, to explosions of light, to true love coming in your fist, to high as a kite in your arms, to crying over the loss of all humans, all the queers and trans and women and children, beasts and sky and water. Last but not least, all the blue sky from the west down to the east, blue just how we see it from here. Blow it all up, and it's a dream remembered by sentries at castles who look out at blue starry, at black starry skies and tell stories of what we learned there, then on a green and blue rock, far away and once upon a time. Oh, dude, you just like hit me in the gut. <laughs> really? You totally made me cry. Oh, my God. No. <laughs> oh, fuck. Yeah, I, that's wow. No one's made me cry during an interview before. <laughs> yeah, <I'm in. laughs> Yeah, you totally win. Thanks for um, not becoming an ancestor too early. I really am grateful. <laughs> Yeah. Um, <laughs> that, good time. Experience. What's your uh, What's the name of your book? It's called Forty Five Thought Crimes, and it's coming out soon. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it should be out in early 2019. Awesome. Yeah, I totally look forward to having that in my hands. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Lydia. That was amazing.
yeah, I want to, I want to just give you a chance to talk a little bit about, um, Home Mobiles, Home Mobiles, the band and the super group Commando, the new metal queer and trans people of color singing amazingness that, um, that you're involved in. I just want to, want to hear, you know, what's up in your life right now. Okay. Well, Home Mobiles ride service has been really kind of dwindling down to a trickle because we don't have an app. But this fabulous guy named Peter Bell, uh, who worked for Upworthy, did this little video, an Upworthy video, and he said, look, you're going to get an app, and everything's going to change because I get a million views on my videos. And I was like, all right, dude, whatever you say, sure. Uh, everybody's been telling me they're going to give us an app forever. And sure enough, these people, uh, General Assembly in Austin, Texas, they're a uh, tech school. They're like, we want to make you an app. And I'm like, yay. So I feel like when we have an app, we'll be able to uh, be one of those apps that you toggle between Uber, Lyft, and Homobiles. And what's funny about that is that Homobiles started the entire rideshare concept and Lyft and Uber which were already happening. Well, well, Uber was happening as a limo service and Lyft looked at home and was like, that's cool. Let's make that happen only for money, real money and make an app. And so now we're coming back around and using the technology that they created to make themselves into multi-billion dollar international corporations. We're going to be like, okay, great. Thanks for making that legal everywhere. Because really where we were at at the time we started, cabs were not that excited. Uh, and so a lot of legal shit has happened, cleared the path for us, and now we're going to have a nap, and then everybody's going to be able to use homobiles, and that's going to be cute. So I'm excited for that. That's happening in 2019, uh, early 2019, along with 45 Thought Grimes. Uh, Commando's new record is also going to come out in 2019, which, did I already tell you about all the singers? There's Krylon Superstar, Juba Kalamka, Honey Mahogany, Drew, Ariola Sands from Trap Girl. And that's just on my side of the record. And then Juba's got a whole other side of the record. He's a from Deep Dick Collective hip hop artist guy. So he'll have a, a different flavor on the other side. But it's all new metal, but with all these different styles of singers on it. Um, I'm really excited about that. Hopefully we'll also have a video. The Home Bills has two records out, and you can find them on SoundCloud. And what else? That's it for now. Then I'm going to write a book called, I don't know what, but it's going to be based on my whole mom saga of being an old queer, taking care of your crazy, demented mom and all the struggles and trials and tribulations and excitement and love and things that you learn about love in your old age. Um, I just want to finish up by giving you a moment to – um, to drop in and just see if there's anything that, you know, any of these amazing ancestors that we've talked about or named or invited or that you have relationship with anything that, um, that wants to come through, through you right now before we finish. Well, there is this great ode to Prince that's in the book. <laughs> That, but you might have to just buy the book. Or you can also hear it on the new Commando record. But yeah, he comes through a lot. Yeah. I was super stoked when I realized, like, oh, now I can work with Prince as an ancestor. And I totally have him on my ancestor altar. It's awesome. Oh, yeah. I have a gigantic poster of him, like, <laughs> larger than life on my wall. Yeah. I think that when I already am inspired by somebody that when they were incarnated is queer ish. Um, and then when they get out there and the, all that is, they can let go of all the constraints of the body and be as all gendered as they want to be and all powerful. And you can have a personal relationship with them. Exactly. Like you were saying. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just thinking about, um, Marsha P. Johnson and just kind of some of the interactions I've had with her around, you know, yeah, like what to do, like how to, how to, how to keep on this path of rage and love and fierceness and clarity and creativity and all the things that, you know, I just really see you bringing so strongly. And I just really, um, I honor you. 
Thank you. I'm grateful for you. And thanks for taking the time to be on the podcast. It's it's super, uh, just super useful, I think, to have these stories and, and this archive of these voices, especially coming out of San Francisco, um, of folks who have like really been holding down it, you know, holding it down and, and continue to hold it down. So thank you, Lynn. Thanks. Oh, P.S. Leslie Vi- Feinberg. Oh, yeah. Fuck yeah. She's on my altar, too. Yeah. They're on my altar. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah totally. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you for all you do. Yeah, thank you. And I just want to thank everyone for listening to this episode of Bespoken Bones Ancestors at the Crossroads of Sex, Magic, and Science. I'm Pavani Moray, and I'll be back every new and full moon with more ancestral wisdom and embodied goodness. Blessings on you and all of your people. Mm-hmm.